Destiny Uncertain by Raj Phillips. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Destiny Uncertain by Raj Phillips. I'm never going to take my last breath, Lynn said with a gloating tone that implied some deep secret. He waited until his remark had had its full dramatic moment, then added, I'm simply going to take my next to last breath and hold it. Jerry Meyer's voice emerged from the wave of laughter, serious. But there does often seem to be something predestined about death, even seemingly accidental death. He shuddered. There were 569 traffic deaths last Labor Day weekend. I wonder how those victims would have felt if they had been told, say, a week before they died, and been unable to avoid it no matter what they did. Nonsense, Phil Arnoff said. We're about surgery, serums, and safety devices. They get demonstrable results in saving lives. A man has an enlarged aorta. Ten years ago, he would have been a goner. Today, he has an operation. They transport a section of the aorta of a dead person, and he lives another twenty years. Jerry sighed. You're getting into a meaningless argument. It could be answered that Destiny brought the operation into the realm of actuality to save him because it wasn't his time to die. There's a lot of evidence to support predestination. Some of the oldest of philosophies and religions are based on it. It is written, is a concept as old as man. And maybe as mistaken as the ancient belief in a god of thunder, Lynn scoffed. And maybe not, Jerry said. You read a book, unless you cheat and look at the ending first, it's like life, unpredictable. But you can skip to the end and see how it will come out, and then start in at the beginning and read with that knowledge. And when you again reach the end, it's still the same because it was already written and unchangeable when you began reading the first page. Sometimes I think real life is like that. Phil and Lynn winked at each other. Then Phil said, Let's well, suppose that's true for the moment. Who does the writing? Jerry shrugged. What difference would that make? There's the old tale of the fates as weavers, weaving a cloth that becomes the events of men's lives as it is woven. And there's another one I heard once or read some place. What's that? Lynn prodded. I was trying to remember where I got it. Jerry said. It doesn't matter. The way it goes, fate is an old man with sightless eyes, sitting at a typewriter, pecking out the events that will happen. Beside him is a wastebasket affair with an eternal flame in it. When the sightless old man finishes one page, he yanks it out and drops it into the wastebasket. The flame consumes it, and as it is consumed, it becomes the reality of life. Say, Phil said, that's a darn cute idea. Writing on paper, burning, and in the process of burning, it transforms into reality by some strange alchemy. I hope you can remember where you read that. Lynn snorted. Maybe he wrote it himself and burned the pages as they were finished, he suggested. He glanced at the clock on the wall. His eyes widened in surprise. I didn't know it was that late, he said, rising. I've got to get to the city before the bank closes. I have to really step on it. Take it easy, Phil called after him. Don't get killed. Nothing to worry about, Lynn called back. If it isn't written, it won't happen, you know. Don't tempt fate, Jerry said warningly. But Lynn was out the door beyond hearing. The sign read slow to 35. Lynn smiled. That was for ordinary cars. His Hudson had a low center of gravity, but he took his foot off the gas and the uphill drag slowed his car to 70, 65, 60, then 55 as he entered the first bend of the S-curve. The pines were tall right to the edge of the shoulder, hiding what was ahead. It was a bad gamble, he decided, but the dashboard clock told him it was one he would have to take. Twenty-four miles to go, yet, and in twenty-two minutes. Even fifty-five was going to make him late. He edged up to fifty-eight, leaning his head over so he could see farther around the bend of the two-lane highway. A car was coming toward him. It was over on its side of the pavement, which was well. There was a woman in it. The color and shape of the hat, which was about all he could really see, told him that. The oncoming car vanished for a moment on the curve. Then it was rushing toward him on the short stretch of straightaway between the two curved sections of the S. Lynn relaxed. There wasn't a thing to worry about. He'd taken the first curve easily. The oncoming car was thirty yards away, then ten, then... It was one of those absolutely incredible instants of time. Something had happened to his Hudson. A blowout? A wheel off? Whatever it was, he had veered straight toward the oncoming car. Instinctively, he turned his wheel to get back into his own lane... The car responded by lifting into the air and turning over. There was a brief, photographic still picture of the other car poised at a crazy angle scant inches in front of him. 
He could see the girl's features clearly, etched in lines of horror. She was nice-looking. Her eyes were wide blue pools, and there were two sharp vertical lines between them. She looked at him then, accusingly, reproachfully. He shook his head in mute apology and wished he could do it over and go slower. Quite calmly, though, he knew they would probably both be killed, and it was strange that time could speed up so quickly in the moment before death. Even now in this instant that hung poised in eternity, he could find time left to wonder what had happened. It couldn't have been a tire. All four tires were less than 5,000 miles old. It couldn't have been a wheel, either. It could have been something in the road. He had been looking at the female hat behind the windshield of that car, and could have missed seeing something on the road. Forgetting what was in front of him, he started to turn his head to look back. He blinked his eyes. There was something wrong. It came to him. He had been about to have a head-on collision with another car. He looked down at the ground where he stood. His feet were resting on a well-packed dirt path that went forward across the grass and curved behind a clump of large-leaved shade trees. He looked around him. No one was in sight. The place was strange to him. He'd never been here before. He closed his eyes and thought back. He was quite certain he had been about to be killed in an accident. It couldn't have been a dream. He opened his eyes again and looked about him curiously. This could be a dream. Or was he dead and was this something after life? There was a test he could make. He tried to remember having reached this point on the path. He turned around and looked back the way it came up the gentle slope of the hill. He couldn't remember having reached this spot at all. There was another test. He used the edge of his shoe to scrape a line on the path. Then he got down on his haunches and studied the ground. There was no sign of his footsteps, but the ground was well packed. He straightened up. There was no use just standing here, he decided. So he started walking, the way he had been facing originally. Suddenly he thought of another test. Stopping, he went through his pockets. Everything was where it should be. His billfold held his identification cards and currency. He studied the currency. It was too perfect in detail to be a figment of a dream. He shook his head in perplexity. Whatever had happened, it was beyond his grasp. Shoving things back in his pockets, he started forward again. The sky was blue with billowing white clouds drifting lazily high above the treetops. Ahead there was the sound of water. Shortly he came to a footbridge that spanned a small and turbulent stream. The path followed the bank of the stream for a hundred yards, then turned sharply and cut through the woods. The trees seemed to be some kind of maple. The ground was covered with short-cropped meadow as though cattle had grazed here. But there was no sign of movement anywhere. But there was something small and black was drifting down toward him in the air, he stopped and waited until he could reach out and seize it between his fingers. It crumpled at his touch. He rubbed it between thumb and finger, examining its texture. It seemed to be a flake of burnt paper, as though someone had tossed a piece of paper in a campfire, and a charred piece of it had floated away on the breeze. He went forward more eagerly now. Undoubtedly someone was ahead of him, probably on a picnic. He could find out from them where he was. And there was a sensible explanation of things now. He had probably been thrown clear of the car and knocked out. That could have lasted for hours while he wandered through the woods. Of course, that was it, he decided with relief. Now all he had to do was find someone and tell them about it, and they would take him back to the scene of the accident. Ahead through the trees he could see the steep bank of a tableland that rose above the treetops. While he watched there was a flurry of motion that swept downward from up there, black flakes that turned and tossed in the breeze, more charred bits of paper. That was obviously where the campfire was. "'Hello up there,' he called. There was no answer. No sound at all. He broke into a trot, marveling that he didn't feel groggy or upset. The path turned in toward the steep bank and terminated at the foot of concrete steps that went upward. When he reached them, he paused to get his breath, then started up the steps at a more leisurely pace. They zigzagged up the face of the steep bank, twelve steps to each section. He paused halfway up and looked over the treetops, which sloped gently for several hundred yards, then dropped away. In the far distance was the hazy panorama of a valley, with two lakes that were irregular blue splotches on a carpet of greens and browns. He resumed his upward climb. Finally, there was only one more section of steps before the top. He sighed with relief and paused to look downward, almost regretting that he hadn't chosen to go the other way on the path. He would almost certainly have run into someone before this, going the other way, and then he wouldn't have had all this climb, but... He shrugged and climbed the last of the steps. 
He was on a flat table of jigsaw design, flagstone cemented together. Twenty feet away was a man. The man, his back to him, was seated on a stone bench before a small stone table, intent on something he was doing, that was concealed by his back and hunched shoulders. In the incredible stillness came the staccato click of what sounded exactly like typewriter keys. As Lynn watched, the man jerked something. A piece of paper appeared briefly, then was dropped into a wire basket where almost invisible blue flames immediately licked at it and began to consume it. Blackened bits floated upward and away, and even as they floated over the edge of the table, the rapid click of the typewriter began again. Hello, Lynn said in a good-natured greeting. The head didn't turn. The clack of the typewriter continued without pause. Lynn hesitated a moment, then approached the man slowly, debating whether he should speak to him again or wait until he paused to rest. The man must not be doing so well with his writing to toss a finished page into the fire so casually. Lynn's lips quirked into a smile. He would sneak up and glance over the man's shoulder and read what he was typing. As he stole forward, he studied what he could see of the man. Instead of conventional attire, he was wearing what seemed to be a heavy gray robe. If he had any hair, it was concealed under the black skull cap he was wearing. The back of his neck was deeply wrinkled like that of a man well past the prime of life. His ears were well formed, but stuck out a trifle too much, and from the speed at which he was typing, he was probably completely unaware of his surroundings. Lynn paused above him and admired the typewriter. It was the most beautiful machine he had ever seen, and electric, he decided, as the man's fingers touched the key and carriage swung back to starting position on a new line. The type on the paper wasn't standard. In fact, some of it didn't even seem to be ordinary letters, but some strange type of symbols. Others were almost ordinary. Lynn leaned forward cautiously in order to make out what was already typed. He saw only two words that were recognizable. One was force in the middle of the second line. The other was late in the line that had just been written. It was a foreign language, Lynn decided, but the two words he could recognize gave no clue to what language it might be. The page was finished. The man's hand seized it and jerked it from the machine, dropping it into the flame in the wire wastebasket and from some automatic feed a new sheet came into view on the platen, and the man continued his typing, his fingers moving with great rapidity and without let-up. Lynn straightened and stepped back a bit so as not to startle the man. He coughed loudly and said, "'Hello there?' The rhythm of the man's typing didn't vary. He gave no indication of having heard. Slightly annoyed, Lynn reached out and tapped him firmly on the shoulder. Still no result. "'Hey there!' Lynn shouted, clamping fingers over the man's shoulders and starting to shake him. "'Hey!' He started to say again, then his voice died away. The shoulder under his fingers was unyielding, too unyielding. His lips took on a stubborn line. He applied force. The shoulder was immovable. He released it and stared down, mystified. The fingers continued their typing without pause, a blur of movement over the keys. With abrupt decision, Lynn stepped around so he could see the man's face. He caught an impression of a lean face, intellectual and relaxed, with firm lips and thin, high-bridged nose. But these were only vaguely noticed because his attention was immediately dominated by the man's eyes. Or lack of eyes, that is. For where his eyes should have been, there was nothing but tightly closed lids that, from their sunken contours, covered no eyes at all, but only empty sockets. Experimentally, Lynn reached out and touched the face. The pale skin was as unyielding as rock. He pressed his finger against the right cheek until his nail bent over, it should have left a mark on any living skin and brought an exclamation of pain from any living person, but it left no perceptible mark, and the man gave no sign of having noticed, and the fingers continued their rapid movement over the typewriter keyboard. Incredulously, Lynn reached out and tried to remove the skull cap. It wouldn't budge, and was as unyieldingly hard as the face. A robot? The exclamation escaped Lynn's lips in a hoarse whisper. Or a statue? In desperation, he seized one of the man's arms at the elbow and tried to interrupt the smooth flow of movement. All his strength couldn't vary the motion of that arm enough to cause a finger to miss a key on the typewriter. Not a millionth of an inch of play in the joints, he said, marveling. For the first time, he turned his attention from the figure before him and examined his surroundings. The robot, or statue, or whatever it was, was seated at a spot practically perched on the edge of a cliff that went down much farther than the stairs on the other side. Here there was a sheer drop of at least a thousand feet, and probably more nearly two thousand. Below, an immense valley stretched out toward the far horizon. Lynn looked out over the valley with a puzzled frown. 
trying to recall if there were any high mountains in this section of the country. There were hills, but no real mountains, nothing to compare with this. How long have I been unconscious? he muttered. His attention jerked back to the typist in time to see another sheet of paper go into the flames. He watched it burn. The flame itself seemed to come out of a round hole in the rock inside the area of the bottom of the wire basket. From its color it was a gas flame. In the dark it would be a bright blue. His attention turned to the typewriter and the stone table on which it rested. An inscription was embossed on the smooth face of the front of the table. Lynn nodded in grim understanding. This was a statue, but a statue such as never had existed on the earth he lived in, or it would have been considered the eighth wonder of the world and known to every schoolchild. An urgency possessed him to seize the next sheet of paper before the flame could get it and try to read it. He waited while the robot statue typed, and when the hand jerked out the sheet to throw it in the flames, he grabbed it, though part of it tore away and dropped into the flame before he could rescue it. He examined the texture of the paper. It had the feel of plastic more than paper. He studied the typing. It was sharp and clear, and completely unintelligible. Or was it unintelligible? He could almost make sense out of the words. Some of the letters that had been strange were taking on a feel of familiarity. He closed his eyes tightly and shook his head, then opened them and looked again. It did make sense, but the sense was just beyond his reach. He looked at the figure bent over the typewriter again, and it struck a chord of familiarity somewhere in his mind. He had heard of this statue somewhere. He remembered now. This statue, or whatever it was, was the embodiment of fate. It was writing all that was in store for each individual, and when it tossed the sheets that were written on in the flame, their burning brought what was written into being, and it happened somewhere just as it had been written. He stared at the fragment of paper he held in his hand and wondered what was written on it, and what events he was holding up by not tossing the sheet in the flame. A smile curved his lips. He held it over the basket. By releasing it, it would drop down and burn. Then whatever event he was holding up would happen. His fingers relaxed. The paper slipped a fraction of an inch. Suddenly he clutched it tightly and drew it to safety. His forehead prickled. Beads of perspiration dampened it. This puzzled him. It was almost as though somewhere in his mind was terrible anxiety. But he was quite calm. He stared at the torn sheet of paper again, the smile playing about his lips. Slowly and deliberately he folded it, and, taking out his billfold, stored it safely away. He took a last look at the silent robot, the clicking typewriter, then crossed the table rock to the stairs and went down them to the path. Again he saw no sign of movement except for the occasional bit of floating charred paper that came from above. He recrossed the stream at the footbridge. He went slower then, looking for the mark he had made in the hard-packed path with the edge of his shoe. He nearly missed it, seeing it only as he stepped over it. Stopping, he turned and looked back the way he had come. Ahead were the broad-leaved trees that looked so much like maples, the path over which he had come. He started to turn, and the world turned topsy-turvy around him. There was the white face of the girl through the windshield of a car, dropping away suddenly and rotating in a mad gyration until the face was upside down and then was gone past him. A dull booming sound exploded on his bewildered mind. Wild forces were tossing him about inside the car so rapidly that there was no way to tell which was up and which was down. As abruptly as it began, it ended. In the dead silence, he heard the screech of brakes. He wondered if it was the girl stopping her car to come back. But he didn't turn his head to look. He was trying to reconcile the sequence of events brought by his senses. It was impossible. He had spent at least two hours walking up that path, watching the robot statue, and walking back down again to where he had first appeared. Yet... If it had happened at all, it had happened in less than a split second, for events in the collision had taken up at the exact point where they had left off. He opened his eyes and saw the creamy, gloss surface of a ceiling and knew at once he was in a hospital. Without moving his head, he let his fingers explore the clean-smelling sheets, the hospital bed gown tied around his neck. A footstep sounded. A nurse looked down at him with a quiet smile. "'Feel all right?' she asked. He dipped his head in an almost imperceptible nod. The nurse went away. There was a swish of wind as the door closed behind her, but he didn't bother to turn his head to look. After several minutes, the swish of the door sounded again. More than one pair of footsteps came toward the bed. Two men, probably doctors, looked down at him. "'How's the patient today?' one of them asked. 
day? Lynn echoed. How long have I been here? Almost a week. It came flooding in. He could remember hours of torturous pain during which he cried for them to put him out of his misery, of at least two terrible nightmarish scenes where he was surrounded by gleaming chrome things and the awful odor of ether. I remember now, he said weakly. Will, will I live? If you had asked us that yesterday, we'd have said no, the doctor said. But, he shrugged. How badly am I hurt? Lynn asked the doctors. Pretty badly, one of them said with grave frankness. Broken back, severed spine. If you live, you'll never walk again. But I probably won't live, Lynn said. The doctors didn't reply. The girl, Lynn said. The one who was driving the other car. Was she hurt? Yes, pretty badly, but she'll live. What's her name? The two doctors looked at each other. One of them said, I believe she gave her name as Dorothy Lake. Tell me, what was it that caused my car to go out of control? Lynn asked suddenly. I can tell you that, one of the doctors said. The mechanic reported that your tie rod, the rod that connects the front wheels together so they stay in line, had come off one of its moorings. Oh, Lynn said vaguely. He was beginning to feel strange. The memory of that interlude atop the mountain had come back. He was remembering that bit of paper he had snatched from the flames. But of course there was nothing in that. Are my things here? He asked abruptly. My billfold? Yes, the nurse said. Your billfold is in the drawer here. Get it, Lynn said. She opened the drawer and brought out the billfold. Open it and see if there's a folded piece of paper that's torn off on one corner, he demanded. He watched while she explored the contents. He recognized the texture of the paper as it came into view. That's it, he said tensely. Give it to me. He tried to lift an arm. He had to be content with taking it in his fingers while his elbows rested on the bed. With shaking fingers, he opened it and saw the typing that was so different from ordinary typing. His fingers no longer shook. He folded the sheet of paper and handed it back. Don't put it back in my billfold, he said. I want you to take that down to the hospital office and have them put it in an envelope and lock it in the safe. Do you understand? I want that taken care of as though it were worth a million dollars. I don't want anything to happen to it. Do you understand? Y yes, she said. I'll do that. Lynn watched her leave the room, then turned with a grin to the doctors. I'll live, he said confidently. I'll live. Nothing can kill me now, so long as that sheet of paper remains intact. He didn't mind at all the way the two men looked at each other with lifted eyebrows. The door swished open. The nurse came in. There's a man down in the waiting room who wants to see you, Mr. Grant, she said. He gave his name as Hugo Fairchild. Lynn frowned. You sure he wants to see me? he asked. I don't know anyone by that name. Yes, it's you, the nurse said. I told him you weren't in any shape to see any visitors, but he said he would take only a moment of your time. All right, Lynn sighed. Send him up, but make sure he doesn't stay any longer than that. Lynn examined the man the nurse brought in. He was of medium height and of ordinary appearance, a type that wouldn't attract a second glance on the street or anywhere else. I'm Hugo Fairchild, the man said. You're Lynn Grant. That's right, Lynn said. Fairchild looked down at Lynn for a moment, then said abruptly, "'I'll come straight to the point. You have a piece of paper that doesn't belong to you. I've come to get it.' Lynn's eyes narrowed. "'How did you know about it? And why do you want it?' "'There's no need to ask questions,' Fairchild said. "'I'm here to get that piece of paper. It's of no importance to you.' "'You can't have it,' Lynn said. Fairchild looked around quickly. "'We're alone,' he said rapidly. I could knock you out with one blow of my fist. If you won't make any outcry, I'll just take it out of your billfold and leave. Lynn watched, grinning as Fairchild opened the drawer and took out the billfold and searched it swiftly. When he saw it wasn't there, he tossed the billfold back in the drawer and looked grimly at Lynn. Where is it? You think I don't know the value of that bit of paper? Lynn said. You'll never get it. But you interest me. How did you get here? You know what I mean. Look, Lynn Grant. 
Fairchild said. I'm desperate. I have to get that paper. It means nothing to you. Please let me have it. It means nothing to me, Lynn said, his voice soft and mocking. If I hadn't snatched that paper from the fire, I would be dead right now. You know that. And so long as I keep it, nothing can ever kill me. That's why you'll never get it. You're insane, Fairchild said. How could a mere piece of paper have that power? It has no meaning whatever. The writing on it is merely nonsense. Then why are you so interested in getting it to put into the flame? Lynn said. If you hadn't shown up, I might in time have rationalized my memories some way and torn the thing up. But not now. Your coming after it convinces me I'm right. You'll never get it. If I don't, Fairchild said, tight-lipped, you'll regret every minute you keep it. You're wrong about it. It has nothing to do with you at all. His voice became pleading. Give it to me, and I promise that you will recover completely, as though you were never in a wreck. The doctors can tell you how much of a miracle that will be. Lynn shook his head. There's more to this than mere superstition or fantastic miracles, he said. I'll never give up that paper until I know what it means and what it's all about. I know I should have died. I don't have anything to lose, whatever I do. So I'm keeping it. You'll regret it. Fairchild said. He turned abruptly to the door, just as the nurse came in. "'I was just going,' he said calmly. That night Lynn slept, and in the morning when he awakened a nurse was bringing in his breakfast tray. "'Good morning,' she said brightly. Lynn yawned and stretched a vague, "'Morning,' coming from his wide-open mouth. The nurse placed the tray where he could reach it easily and started to leave the room. At the door she stopped abruptly and gasped, then turned and looked at him. She opened her lips to say something, thought better of it, and hurried out. Less than five minutes later, she returned with one of the doctors. She was saying, He did. I saw him with my own eyes, as she opened the door. Good morning, Lynn, the doctor said. The nurse tells me she saw you pull your legs up without touching them. Of course she's wrong. Lynn looked at his knees where they pushed the blankets up, a startled expression on his face. So I did, he whispered in amazement, and he moved his legs again. "'That's impossible!' the doctor said sharply. "'So it is,' Lynn said, grinning. "'I must have established a telepathic bridge across the severed nerves.' "'That's impossible, too,' the doctor said. But his first surprise was wearing off. He came to the bed and pulled down the blankets and stood there watching Lynn move his legs. "'Better take it easy until we check in with fluoroscopy,' he warned. "'There's something mighty funny here.' I examined the x-ray plates myself. The spinal break was unmistakable. Half an hour later, Lynn was relaxed on the table in the x-ray lab, while a full half-dozen doctors studied him through the fluoroscope screen, and all talked at once, with every once in a while one of them going to an illuminated plate and tracing what was quite obviously a wide gap in a spinal column. "'I think I could walk without any trouble if you let me get up,' Lynn remarked. "'Good heavens, no!' one doctor gasped. "'I don't see why not,' another said. "'If we had nothing to go on but what we see now, you'd agree nothing's wrong with him. Why not let him try?' There were uneasy mutterings that gradually drifted into a majority opinion that he should try. The technician moved the fluoroscope screen out of the way. Lynn sat up, swiveled gently ninety degrees, and lowered his legs over the edge of the table. Cautiously, he eased his feet to the floor. Even more cautiously, he let his weight gradually settle on them. While the doctors watched without seeming to breathe, he stood up and took a timid step, a more bold one, and then walked several steps and turned around, coming back to the table. "'Feels perfectly natural,' he said. "'I guess you'll have to admit you were wrong about that spinal cord break.' "'But we weren't wrong,' it was the doctor who had charge of Lynn in the first place. "'The X-rays prove it.' "'Are you sure they weren't mixed up with those of some other patient?' another doctor suggested. "'Find me another patient in this hospital who has a spinal break half an inch wide, and I'll—' I'll... "'Eat him?' Lynn suggested. "'Yes, I'll eat him, gladly. There was definitely no error. A miracle is more possible than those x-ray plates getting mixed up.' "'Does this fix me up, then?' Lynn asked. "'Can I leave the hospital?' "'Not for another two or three days under any circumstances,' his doctor said. "'Personally, I think we should put you on display, permanently. The first proven miracle in two thousand years, or more.' but we'd like you to remain long enough for us to make sure this isn't some freak happening that will undo itself, 
and also to give us time to get used to the fact that you can walk. Okay, Lynn said. 